Hello everybody, I welcome you all in the demo session on AWS and DevOps on behalf of Tech Stories Bangalore. I'm expecting to keep this tight and short and crisp. Unlike the default textbook approach where we talk about what cloud computing is, what AWS is and let's say what DevOps is and going by examples, we would reverse the order completely. We will start with an example first. Moving on to the definition of cloud computing and understanding AWS cloud where AWS stands in the world of cloud computing. Moving on to DevOps once again with an example and ultimately talking about the course on how your experience is going to be with us in Tech Stories. Let's get started with the example first. I'm pretty sure being in the 21st century, you have definitely used at least one among the following services. Netflix, Amazon Prime Videos, Geo Cinema, YouTube, Hotstar, etc. So what's common among all these companies? Yes, all of them are video streaming companies. They stream videos, right? They stream movies, they stream TV shows, web series and all those things. Now let us just pick up one among them. Let's say we pick up Netflix. The question I'd like to ask you right now at this point, do you know how Netflix works? Well, I definitely do from the user's perspective, at least I'm guessing so. So what are the steps as an end user that you take? First of all, you go for opening up the Netflix application, maybe on your smartphone, maybe on your laptop, on your desktop or whatever device you might be on. Number two, you go for signing up for that. Or let's say if you already have an account, you try to log into that account, right? Once you do so, then you are presented with a catalog of movies or a web series or, or TV series or TV shows or whatever. And from that, you are supposed to choose one among them. Once you choose one among the videos, they start streaming in front of you. That's the flow, right? All right, now let's try to break it down from the a uh, little bit from the IT perspective, right? Irrespective of whether you belong from the IT background or not, I'm pretty sure this will start making sense to you. See, when the first time you go to the Netflix application or maybe on your desktop, you write down the URL of Netflix website or on your phone or on your laptop or whatever. The first thing you do, I think you'll agree with me, you go and you hit the Netflix server. Don't you think so? Yes we go and hit the Netflix server. I think you have heard about this. When you try to, let's say, type facebook.com on your phone, on your laptop, and you do not get it, people say the Facebook server is down. That means there is some sort of a server associated in this entire process. So when you first hit on your browser, netflix.com, you go and you hit the server of Netflix. Once you reach the Netflix server, then it returns you with a page asking for your credentials. You have to write down your username, your password. This username and password is once again returned back to your server, which cross checks this credential information with something known as a database. There is a database maintained of the users who are the valid users of Netflix. Against that database entry, they match your credentials. If there's no match, you have no luck. But once there's a match, you immediately get an access to the catalog of movies or let's say TV series or TV shows depending upon what kind of a plan you have purchased from them. Now from this catalog, once you choose a video, it no longer goes back to your database. It goes to something known as a storage device. Databases are very poor while storing big media. They cannot really handle big media in a nice way. So we have got a separate storage device for it. In the storage device, all these movies, TV series, or whatever the thing is that is kept over there. As soon as you select one from the application that reaches that particular storage device, pulls the movie or the video or the web series for you, and ultimately that is displayed on your screen. This is on an overview the flow of how Netflix, YouTube, Amazon Prime Videos, Hotstar, these things typically work. Now, if you notice, we have talked about two things over here, two very, very important things. We talked about servers application servers, database servers, but they're ultimately servers. And the other thing that you have talked about is your storage device, where your videos were being stored. Now understand this fact that when you've got a server, you've got a storage, you've got several servers in fact. You try to, you try to set up a communication among all of them. We are essentially talking about setting up a network. So a network is a communication channel between multiple devices, right? You take all these devices together, we ask them to communicate, therefore we set up a network. Networks, servers, and storage. These three things together form the basis of your IT infrastructure. And when you try to set up this IT infrastructure on a very large scale, 
which will be accessible irrespective of which geographical location you belong to, irrespective of which time of day or night you are trying to access it. Therefore, not bound by your geography, not bound by your time is known nothing but cloud computing. Yes, that's the definition of cloud computing and congratulations, you just now knew what cloud computing is. So once again, to define formally, cloud computing is all about setting your IT infrastructure, which once again will be the driving force for your business. To set up your IT infrastructure on a place which can be accessed over the web without any geographical or time barrier. So I believe it was enjoyable to understand how Netflix works, isn't it? Netflix is by the way on AWS cloud. Amazon Prime Videos is on AWS cloud. YouTube by the way doesn't belong to AWS cloud and it is in turn present on the Google cloud. Now that we have understood what the basics of cloud computing is, let's try to dive into a little bit more specifically onto AWS. Now AWS, which stands for Amazon Web Services, is the cloud solution from Amazon. Yes, it's the same Amazon company that supplies your e-commerce needs. They have come up with a cloud solution known as AWS and it is by far the most popular and the most chosen cloud computing platform by the experts in this industry. All over there are thousands of cloud companies, but AWS alone has got a market share of more than 50% at the time of making of this video. AWS is a very flexible yet scalable infrastructure based model of cloud computing, widely used for variety of solutions in the present day industry. It's extremely easy to start working with AWS cloud. Anybody with absolutely zero level of experience can start working with AWS, not in a few months, not in a few weeks, but in a few days. Yes, you heard me right. It can be done. The way we need to get started to work with AWS cloud is that we need to sign up for an AWS account, which is once again free of cost and it remains free of cost for most of the services for one year of time from the date of your registration. Let's get into our screen and let's see how we can get an account with AWS. So this is the official website of AWS Amazon.com. You can see the URL goes like AWS Amazon.com. Now once you come over here, you'll find this orange button which says create an AWS account. Once you click on that, you will find out the sign up page is loading. And you can see it immediately tells that it is 12 months of free tier access. In our course, we shall be seeing that which all services fall under free tier and what all limitations are applied on them. You have to write down your email address. You have to write down your password. Make sure your password follows the policy that is mentioned over here. And after that, you have to write down an account name. So this account name can be anything of your choice. And you can click on continue. Once you do so, you have to give your credit card information or you can give your debit card information if you want to and your address. And once all these things are done, your AWS account is ready. And after that, you can sign in by writing your registered email ID and the password. And that's it. Congratulations. You're all set to go with AWS right now. So that was fairly easy, isn't it? Just to talk about a little bit of features of AWS cloud, you get an automated networking solution. You get your EC2 instances, which are the virtual servers on cloud. You get S3, which is the storage solution I was talking about in our first example. You get an immense flexibility in setting up your own auto scaling services, which means that your infrastructure can automatically scale up or scale down depending upon the load that it is experiencing. And yes, we do learn these techniques in our course. We have got an automated monitoring solution. We have got DNS servers, database servers, migration services, and whatnot. AWS is the global market leader in the field of cloud computing on the domain of IT infrastructure. Now that you have built an introductory understanding on cloud computing, it's time that we try to understand a little bit of DevOps. Let's try to figure out that why suddenly there is so much of hype about DevOps. Why all the software companies, they're trying to accommodate DevOps into their projects. Now let's start from this fact that DevOps stands for development and operations. Now, before you close this video and you think that, okay, I do not know anything about development. I do not know programming, coding and all those things. Let me assure you DevOps neither incorporates coding nor programming, nothing like that. You will understand in the due discussion that is going to come forward. 
Now, once again, DevOps stands for Development and Operations. Now, I know that doesn't mean much, but that's definitely a point to start with. See, to understand DevOps, we need to first understand the, how the software industry works or the software development companies actually work. Companies follow a certain structure while making a software, which is known as the SDLC, standing for Software Delivery Lifecycle or Software Development Lifecycle. In SDLC, we have got certain steps. And it's critical that we understand those steps first before we try to comment on how DevOps is trying to help us out in the SDLC altogether. Step number one happens to be getting the requirements from your client. Once you've got the requirements, you try to do a feasibility study whether this particular requirement is able to be delivered by your project right now given the people you have got in your project or you want to do some new hiring or whatever that comes into picture. Once you find out a project to be feasible, you try to do a design for that. Design can be meaning, let's say, how do you design the user flow? How does a user enter your application? What the things they do and ultimately they get out of your application. The complete idea on what you click, what opens up, how that looks like and all those things. Once that is done, then people try to go for developing the software. The developers come into picture, the programmers. They write their programs, they develop the application. Once it is developed, it moves to the next phase that is the testing. In testing, we have got the quality analysts who try to compare the actually built application with the originally expected application behavior, if they are the same or not. Simply speaking, they try to figure out whether the application is behaving as per the design completely or not. Once a software is tested and found to be working perfectly fine, it is deployed on the production servers. Deploying on the production server simply means handing over to your client. So now your application is ready to be used by your client. Your client might be people like we took the example of Netflix while talking about cloud computing. So in case of Netflix, we are the clients, we are the clients, the people who use Netflix. And once the software goes live, that's on production, we try to go into maintenance for the software. Means we try to figure out if something goes wrong, how to fix it immediately to make sure the customer experience is not getting harmed and all those stuffs. Now, if you see all these steps, if you try to do manually, it takes you a huge amount of time. In earlier ages, there are situations when one software project will take three years to be built. And that was horribly bad. Nowadays, when we have cloud computing, we have so many things with ourselves. When the things are so flexible, so scalable, how do you think even it works out if you take three years to build a software application? It doesn't. Therefore, we try to incorporate the DevOps practices to speed up this entire process with the help of certain automation tools. Now, before we go into the tools, let's try to understand the process that DevOps tries to bring in. Now, it's, it's critical to understand that not everything in an SDLC can be automated. For example, you cannot automate coding. You cannot ask a robot to write a code or a tool to write a code instead of a human. That is impossible. But yes, you can automate testing. You can automate deployment. You can automate the entire maintenance activity. How do we do so? Of course, using tools. Let's see the process once. So developer, let's say, has written the code and the code is ready. That's where DevOps actually starts after the development is over. Developer is required to upload the code in some sort of a repository. What is a repository? A repository is a place where developers can upload the code and the other stakeholders can go and they can have a look at it. We set up an automation tool which keeps on looking at the repository to figure out if there is some new upload happening or not. Once there is a new upload, this tool automatically pulls it. It tries to run a testing activity on top of it. If the testing turns out to be fruitful, which means all the test cases are passed, then it is taken to the next step which is called deployment. In case the testing fails, this automation tool is capable enough to send an automated email to the developer mentioning the code failure. In case of the positive scenario where the test cases are passing, it is handed over to another group of tools which are known as the deployment tools. Now there are multiple kinds of deployments and therefore we have multiple kinds of deployment tools. I'll talk about the tools shortly. After the deployment is over, following the last step of SDLC, that is maintenance, will also be carried out automatically by DevOps. We'll be incorporating some tools which will be doing an automated monitoring of this application, which means to figure out if something is going wrong, if everything is fine or not and all those things. Once they find out that something is not right, they would immediately notify another set of tools who can in turn go and fix the problem 
and make sure that the thing is taken care of. And that's how DevOps speeds up the entire process. Let's have a look at the tools that we generally use for implementing DevOps. The repository where the developer has to upload the code, we generally use GitHub for that. GitHub is a very popular and a well-known repository. It is widely used all over the world. The first automation tool that I was talking about, also known as the continuous integration tool, is known as Jenkins. Jenkins is a tool that can monitor the GitHub repository and try to figure out if there is a new upload happening on GitHub. In the terminology, in the official terminology, we call it a push happening on GitHub. If there is a push that has happened on GitHub, Jenkins will immediately pull that into itself. And it will try to incorporate another tool known as Maven for doing the building of that code. Building of the code can be simplified into conversion to binary. Think about this. Computers do not understand human languages. You need to convert it into binary for them to understand. That is one of the activities that takes place in building phase. There are many more which we shall be learning in our subsequent classes. Once the building is over, we take it for testing. And in this testing activity, we shall be taking help of a tool known as Selenium. Jenkins triggers a Maven build and after that, it triggers a Selenium test. If anywhere between the building or the testing it fails, it will trigger an automated email to the developer mentioning the exact problem. And if both these steps are passing, then it hands it over to something known as Docker. Docker takes care of deployment. Now if you remember, I told that there are multiple kinds of deployments. So we have got multiple kinds of deployment tools. Docker is one of them. Another one is known as Swarm. Another one is known as Kubernetes. Docker is for a single server deployment. That is when you have only one server, you are deploying on top of it. Kubernetes and Swarm is targeted towards clusterized deployment, which means when you have multiple servers together and you form a cluster out of that, you want to deploy on top of it. Docker, Kubernetes, Swarm, these things are also known as continuous deployment tools or CD tools. Next, if you remember, we talked about monitoring for the maintenance activities. For monitoring, we have got a wonderful tool known as Nagios. Now, Nagios is a tool that does application monitoring also, server monitoring also. What does that mean? There is a server on which you have put your application. You have to figure out that server is running or not because it has to run in order for the application to be served to your client. Also, within the server, the application also should be running. So both your server as well as your application should be running. And Nagios has a wonderful capability to check both of them. Now, in case there is some issues going on, how do you fix it in the maintenance phase? You have got another two tools. You have got a tool called Ansible coming from a very famous vendor known as Red Hat, who also produces a wonderful version of Linux known as Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which we shall be working on a lot in this entire course. Also, we have another tool known as Terraform. Terraform and Ansible, both these tools are wonderful that, that help you in building and maintaining a complete infrastructure just from your command line without requiring you to actually log into your remote servers. Now, when you learn all these tools and you know how these tools work and try to make an interaction among all these tools to form a complete end-to-end -end pipeline, that's when you start implementing DevOps. I told you I'll talk about an example about DevOps as well. Remember today's first example, we talked about Netflix. Now as a user, you go in and you register or sign in and you go and you get the catalog, you select a movie and you watch the movie. This was the steps for the user. Now these steps are determined in the design phase and then the coding is done. After the coding is done, DevOps enters the show. Once the developers of Netflix, they have written the code of Netflix, the Netflix application that is running on the server, which is supplying you the movies and taking your username, password, verifying and all those things that is happening over there. That is first tested by using automation tests. Then that is deployed using a continuous deployment tool on the Netflix server. And that is maintained by using this maintenance and monitoring solutions that I just now talked about. And that is how DevOps is implemented in Netflix. Right, so I guess you have already built your introductory knowledge on AWS and DevOps. Now let's talk about the course a little bit. 
all those things that we have talked about so far starting from your servers storages networking databases migrations and all those things in aws cloud what have we talked about devops that is your automated testing automated building continuous integration continuous deployment monitoring maintenance and all those things every individual participating in this course is practically going to do all these things there are no theoretical sessions the course runs on 100% practical model we start by understanding the fundamentals of networks a little bit because other than that it becomes a little difficult to actually go into the aws flow we get onto aws we start preparing our networks which we have learnt in the fundamentals and then slowly we make our way to servers storages databases monitoring administration and all those things it takes a little bit more or less one month of time to become an AWS Solutions Architect. Once you finish your AWS Solutions Architect course, you get three completely hands-on projects focusing on three different parts of your AWS, namely one on administration, one on monitoring, and one on architecting. Because these three are the major roles where you'll find people working in the industry. Then we start with DevOps. We'll try to learn all those 11 tools that we talked about after familiarization with the flow of DevOps. DevOps once again takes around one month of time, if not more, and we will be completely working on Linux machines for that. Now, in case you don't feel comfortable enough to work with Linux machine, you'll be completely guided from tech stories for your Linux fundamental sessions as well. In our course, we shall be building our CI CD pipeline. We'll be using some configuration management tools to build infrastructures and all those things. And that will also once again follow with three projects in the CI CD and the configuration management domain. You can find the headlines of these projects if you log on to www.techstories.com and follow the courses accordingly. Altogether, the entire practical training that you're getting followed by the six projects. It opens up three complete fields of jobs in front of you. One is purely on AWS, stands for AWS Administrator, AWS Architect, or it's a Solutions Architect. And if you're carrying a little less experience, then as a monitoring guy on AWS Cloud. The second field of job is going to be purely DevOps, where you work either in CI part or in CD part, or you go and work in the configuration management section. And the third field of opportunity that opens up in front of you is going to be the combination of AWS and DevOps. That is a DevOps associate on AWS Cloud, which is by far one of the highest demanding jobs in the software industry in 2020 and coming 2021. So all over the course extends for around two and a half months of time to have your flexibility to choose your batches from weekdays to weekends, classrooms or online in the morning, in the afternoon or in the evening. Your representatives will completely help you out in this particular regard and they will make sure you get the most suitable time for your class. Also, there are some additional services that you get along with the course, which will be clarified to you by your representative. If you felt this video is informative, make sure you drop a feedback below or hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this. Thank you and on behalf of Team Tech Stories, wish you all the very best for achieving your career goals. Thank you so much.